Hey everybody, welcome to Subnet. This is Gabriel Cardona, and I am joined tonight by the amazing, the one and the only Connor Daly. What is up, Connor? How's it going, man? Excellent. Thank you for uh, joining me. As you guys can see, I'm in a new place tonight. So um, this last few days, I have been moving from one apartment to another. So finally got everything set up. Now the uh, interesting issue is finding where I packed all of the other critical things. So I'm like 80% there, but there's still some stuff to do to dial in. So um, I asked Connor to be a regular on the guest or a regular on the show as much time as he's willing to contribute simply because number one, I like Connor and uh, we get along well and it's, he's easy to talk to. And number two, uh, he has an, a, really a wealth of information about the Avalanche ecosystem. He's plugged into a bunch of different projects and working on a bunch of different stuff. And then number three, our skills really complement each other. I know web, te uh, web two, traditional web tech and cloud services really well. And then Connor really does know his smart contract work really well. And so I feel like together, if we bring on different guests, we can uh, have different angles of questions to ask them. And then as we talk about different news topics, we can also have different insights there simply because we bring different stuff to the skill table. So welcome, Hope I'm glad to have you on the regular. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, no, so yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for having me again. Yeah, this is, uh, I think, a really exciting opportunity for both of us. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we had such a great conversation a couple of weeks ago, and I, I just wanted to do more of that. So we're going to try to do it, you know, as much as we can and mm -hmm. uh, do a mixture of like having guests. And then when we can't have guests, you and I are going to come up with topics to talk about. And because uh, there, there's just so much going on, like this is the, the best part about working in crypto is there's so much that happens every single week, every single day, even that just you can't predict what your job is going to be like a month from now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's challenging to keep up with it all. So that's like one of the soft skills is simply how much can you keep up with and how much can you keep in your mind? I know several times I've commented when we were working with AWS, sometimes you click the AWS drop down menu and there's so many items that you really think, what must it be like to be a project manager on the <laughs> AWS infrastructure? And I get a sense of it now. There's just so many things that happen every single week in uh, Avalanche that sometimes it's, it's, it's not only challenging to keep your mind wrapped around it all, but then you'll just stop and you'll think, was that really just last week that all of that other stuff happened? And since then, we've had all of these other things. So, yeah, we um, decided we are going to have a first segment where we just cover a few different uh, This Week in Avalanche type news topics. There's, again, there's so many different things that have happened in the last week. And then after that, we're going to go into a topic for each uh, show. Today, we're going to do a deep dive on NFTs. There's just a ton of stuff going on NFTs that we both have been involved with and then some other interesting projects that we thought might be worth talking about. But before we get started on that, we're going to do This Week in Avalanche, the um, recap of interesting new news items. So I think the big one, one of the big ones that happened this last week is that the new Avalanche Ethereum bridge went live. And um, we have on our roadmap uh, to be interviewed as a guest, Michael Kaplan. He's actually the creator and the lead of this project, but um, he, that's in a couple of weeks. He's doing some summertime stuff right now. But since it went live this last week, we figured we would talk about it right now. And I think um, the super high level improvements are that. So we had an existing bridge, uh, AEB.xyz. Before we even talk about uh, the new bridge, how involved were you with the the existing bridge? I was a little bit involved. <clears throat> so when we were putting that together, uh, Ava Av Labs, the company, is not responsible for the AB bridge. We did work with a few. We did coordinate it between a few different entities, mm -hmm. but the actual bridge is cr created by Chainsafe, and is a relayer bridge. And the relayers, Ava Labs, was not a relayer. The relayers were. Hashcork, ProtoFire, mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember them all off the top of my head, but yeah, it was not Avalab. So we were just kind of the coordinating entity that was working with these different companies to try to create this secure system. So I helped a little bit with some of the debugging. You were involved though with the Pangolin stuff, I suspect, right? Because there was a yes. lot of bridging tokens, right? Yes. So we were trying to tie in the bridge launch with the launch of Pangolin. So there was a lot of cross involvement there. And yeah, just when we were actually trying to make the bridge work, uh, I was on the front lines helping solve some of the problems uh, that were popping up. So I, I, was, I was involved with it. Yeah. And were the contracts that, again, before we even talk about the new bridge, I know that recently you put out a great, if you're not following Connor on Twitter, you should go do that right now. What is your Twitter handle? Uh, DAS underscore Connor. So D-A-S underscore C-O-N-N-O-R. So yeah, so I, I put out a few threads. I did a whole series actually on, on bridges. And if you actually, if you go look at my pin tweet on my profile, mm -hmm. I have links to all of my threads 
And I did a whole series on bridges. So I talked about what bridges are, why they're important, some of the most important security properties of bridges, how they can go wrong, uh, how bridges are actually like the entire key to the multi-chain ecosystem and you know, why their security matters. And also right. kind of I'd love people. to dig in that, by the way. Sorry to cut you off, but I know one of your tweets said like the most important part of this is the UX between the bridge or something. I don't want to oversimplify, but I'd love to dig in that to your topic, to your thinking there as well, because you definitely highlighted that bridges are such a critical part because they're the, the link between the two different ecosystems and that it's a single point of failure and it's an attack vector. And there's so many different, you know, pros and cons of using the bridge model. So I'd be interested on your thoughts there. And another topic I wanted to cover before we even get to the other bridge is I know that one of the tweets you put out recently was about how to determinist deterministically recreate the same contract address mm, yeah. using, I think the create to opcode or something like that. And I was wondering, um, was that taken into account when we did the initial bridge? Do you know? Do the contracts on both sides of the bridges have the same addresses? If not, was that a huge hassle? What what all went into that? So I'm interested on in both of your thoughts there. Um, your the importance of bridges, and then what? Did, how much thought did actually went into creating deterministic addresses? Did we do that? Did it matter? How did that play out? So, I guess I'll I'll, I'll answer these in the reverse order. Sure. So, we did not actually have the capability of doing deterministic addresses for the first bridge because the the tokens that we were bringing over like we didn't create those so you can right. only use the deterministic addresses if it's the same contract and it's the same person creating them Fair enough. and so if you're interested in this basically yeah there's a, a, a special command in the evm called the create two command which will let you deploy at a deterministic address so and the benefit actually, of that is simply what the benefit is so that you can show to people hey we got the same address it's the same crew on both sides yeah, I think I think that's exactly it, and just cross-chain interoperability. And it, it's like if you go to a, a DApp that's like deployed across a lot of chains, if you go to their GitHub, where they'll have their token addresses, and you know what, they have a token address for every chain they're deployed on. Right. Or the really cool folks are just like, here's our addresses. Doesn't you know for every every ecosystem we're a part of. Right. And it's just one one set of addresses, and that's really cool. It's really developer friendly so you don't have to worry about all the all the switch cases you need to do mm -hmm. and it you know it just shows you that the team knows what they're doing um we didn't necessarily have the capability to give the tokens on avalanche the exact same address as their ethereum counterparts because you know we don't have we didn't use the same contract that like tether is natively deployed with or link is natively deployed with mm -hmm. we also don't have access to the addresses that originally deployed those contracts. Mm -hmm. One thing we could have done, but did not do, uh, is deploy them with the create to address on Avalanche, because if we had intended to bridge with other chains, we could have used the same bridge contract address across different chains. We did not do that. Um, the Avalanche Ethereum bridge was only ever intended to be an Avalanche Ethereum bridge. Um, but as far as like the importance of bridges, I think uh, the bridge security is this, this hugely important issue. And I, I'm going to dive deep on this with, with Michael when uh, he's on the, on the podcast. But I think a, an attack against a very popular bridge is a doomsday scenario for crypto. <laughs> it, it is one of the worst possible things that could happen to us as a whole because it, the, the worst possible bug is, bug is actually it's an infinite minting bug where you can mint an infinite amount of liquidity on the destination chain. Most people, when they're worried about bridge attacks, are worried about um, people stealing their collateral, stealing their coins on the source chain, which I think is not as bad because it's kind of a capped attack. There's there's a fixed amount of money that you can steal, and it's just the, in the, the 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 source pile in the collateral pile. But if you have an infinite minting attack, you can actually steal a lot more than that collateral, because because we have these DeFi tokens and you know, like for instance, on Avalanche for the A Avalanche Ethereum bridge, all of those tokens are traded against on Pangolin. And you can go to Pangolin and if you could mint an infinite supply of one of them, you could basically drain all the Pangolin pools with your infinite tokens. Then you could also go to like a lending protocol like Aave or something like that. And then you could take out a loan against an infinite amount of tokens. You could drain all of Aave and you could just drain all these protocols of all their money. And then... <clears throat> You could mint more tokens and use those to go across the bridge to other chains. And then you could do this to other chains as well and just steal all the liquidity from all of the DeFi protocols on all of the chains that your bridge is connected to where your token is trusted. And there's just, 
a lot of like really bad things that could happen. So if you actually really start thinking about bridge security, like it is a super important problem. Um, and so that's one of the reasons I'm really excited about this new avalanche, uh, avalanche bridge. It's not an avalanche Ethereum bridge. We're just calling it the avalanche bridge. Yeah, I realized I misquoted. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, I called it the avalanche Ethereum the bridge. AB. It's not. Yeah, the AB. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, you're correct. So then I guess real quick to sort of cap off your thought there. So what is the, what is the guard against that? The guard against that is best practices. So hopefully the devs are doing the right thing. Another guard against that is security audits. Hopefully the, the stuff is being audited by, you know, great teams um, like Halborn and all these other teams, as well as, you know, the community, if it's open source. And then another one I'm guessing is like bug bounties and stuff like that. So to try and incentivize people to do the right thing, as opposed to do the, right, the wrong thing. It's, it's also a problem for, for DAP developers of just thinking about like, and, and users thinking about how should we use this bridge as tokens in our ecosystem? Uh, how, you know, how, should, how interoperable should we make them? Because you kind of end up becoming as strong as your weakest link, which is the problem. So if you have multiple bridges, you want to choose the bridges with highest security because if you build your applications on the bridge with the weakest security, if that gets compromised, you're screwed. Like there's, there's some major repercussions. I think there's also probably some stuff that you can do that might be practical for like capping the amount of money you can move over per day or mint per day, um, which would be inconvenient for some whales. But in general, you know, you might not want to move more than $10 million a day per coin or something like that. It also makes me think that there is like a potential honeypot type scenario here. So I'm putting on my black hat here. So I'm thinking like, what if I wanted to attack the network? Um, so one of the things I remember is when the AE bridge was, AEB bridge was first being created, there were other bridges, I won't name any names because I'm not trying to shed any dirt on anybody's name or brand, but I remember there was some question about, do we use the AEB bridge or do we use some of these other bridges? And the general sentiment was, well, the AE bridge is open source and it's kind of being um, funded by a grant from the either Ava Labs or the Avalanche Foundation, I don't remember exactly which, but it's, it's more sort of the trusted one that you should use. And the other one, nobody really knows about. It. we're not sure about the team we're not sure about the open source nature of it and so i wonder as an attack could you do you i, I suppose i know the answer to my question you could uh, right create your own type of bridge that itself was in in some form not totally secure and then incentivize people who aren't really looking to do the best thing maybe they're just looking for a quick buck or maybe they're looking to route around some of the other limits that you just mentioned maybe the, the legit bridges have to put in some limits on place to prevent the kind of attack you're suggesting. So it, it also opens up the possibility of a black hat attack or a honeypot attack type yeah, attack. Yeah, it's, it's totally a vector for rug pulls. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Especially because most bridges that come out are relayer bridges. And so the way those work is they basically have a multi-sig where they mm -hmm. have people vote on chain. And you need, you know, we'll say three out of five people. This is how the AEB works. Um, you have three out of people who sign each transaction that they basically actually work as oracles. If you think about it, like oracles and bridges are actually kind of the same problem. Um, you have these relayers who basically watch both chains. They wait for transactions to complete. And they say, you know, if you moved uh, 10 die into the bridge account on the source chain, then I'm going to mint 10 die on the destination chain. And so they just say, it's time to mint. And they'll like, give us their signature. And once you get three yes votes, you perform the mint. So in that case, all of your security for that bridge is relying on your relayers. And if the relayers are dishonest or if they collude, then they can steal all your money or they could mint infinite amounts of money. So the way to, uh, so you, you need trustworthy rel uh, relayers. That's, that's a hard requirement. And so if I were to design a bridge and wanted to do a rug pull, I would just create a bridge with say five relayers, but they're all me. And they just wouldn't actually be independent parties. And then I would say, yo, this is a safe bridge. We're, we're, we're very highly trusted. There's different members of the community. I might even lie. I, make up, I might make up some real members of the community that you know, just wouldn't deny it because they don't monitor social media or something like that. And I might say, well, Google is a relayer for us or something like that because <laughs> Google that's probably the news, respond. And that's the news people would want to hear, right? People would just automatically love to hear that. There's plenty of people who go crazy if they heard Google or some other large brand was a relayer. So a question then, and um, 
this might be something we need to ask Michael. So some of the features real quick about the new AEB bridge are it's, um, it's five times cheaper than the existing AEB.XYZ uh, bridge. So this is the part that perhaps you know more about or perhaps we'll need Michael's uh, insight, but I know it uses Intel SGX Enclave. And so basically all the operations are in a closed environment and it's, it's tamper proof. And then it uses wardens that use remote attestation to uh, basically confirm that the transfers are legit or that they're able to be kicked off on the other side. Do you know our wardens different than relayers in some fundamental way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I actually, my, my previous job, I spent a lot of time working with secure hardware. I didn't work with the Intel SGX specifically, but I worked a lot with trusted platform modules, their TPMs. The memory flasher. Yeah, <laughs> that's all open source. You can actually go go check it out. I've worked on a project called uh, Host Integrity at Runtime and Startup. So uh, the cool thing about this, the real innovation on the AB bridge is not that we've necessarily gotten rid of relayers. Wardens are fairly similar to relayers. Okay. But what we did is we moved all of the computation for those relayers off chain. So instead of having to vote, have the relayers vote on chain for whether or not to sign transactions or reject them, mm -hmm. all of that computation happens off chain in a secure enclave. Got it. So the wardens, they perform a couple different functions. So one is they bootstrap the key for the, for the trusted enclave so that we don't just have a single point of failure. If the box we're running on and the cloud dies, we're not screwed. We can recover all everybody's money. Okay. So at the end of the day, in the new AV bridge design, you still have to trust the wardens, uh, which we have four wardens. We have a three of four multi-sig. And the f I don't know who the wardens are off the top of my, my head, but they are trusted companies in the community. You can ask them. They will confirm that they are working for us. And they're in the press releases. But the um, so the wardens, they will help bootstrap by generating the key. They use a, a, a form of cryptography known as Shamir secret sharing. Uh, so they help generate the key. And then they also perform something called remote attestation, which the secure hardware, the Intel SGX, the cool thing about what it does is it's very tamper proof. Um, but not only is it tamper proof, it's able to measure itself and determine if it has been tampered with. And so basically this is what the remote attestation is, is it measures itself using a uh, technology that's like not inside the enclave itself. It measures itself and says, this is the hash of the code I'm running right now. And then it reports it out to all of the wardens and the wardens can check is that hash of the code that's running the hash of the code that's expected. And if it, it's not, then they know that something's wrong and they have the power to shut down the bridge. Got it. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And so then how much of this you just mentioned that's not happening on chain. So how much of this is still smart contract and chain driven, or is it just primarily something that's happening off chain? Yeah. So, so the actual voting for deciding whether or not to mint a, uh, mint a transaction or not mint. So that happens within the enclave. So it's actually not multiple parties voting anymore. It's a single party that's doing it, but that part that it's in, within the secure enclave. So the code that's being running is constantly being verified by the wardens. And so that uh, single process is what it's checking. Uh, is code, is, 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 are tokens being delivered to the source? And then if they are, then we mint on the destination. Okay, got it. Thank you. That helps clear up a lot. Mm -hmm. And so I know some of the features are secure, fast and transparent, and then multi-chain. And a couple ones I wanted to dig in on there are, so I know, um, I've, I've seen the user experience. You guys have, my, have seen, there's a really, really great GIF out there. Go look for this on Twitter. But basically the user experience room when you're using the new bridge is, correct me if I'm wrong here, Connor, but you have to wait, I believe nine uh, blocks in the Ethereum ecosystem before you can be confident that your transaction is not gonna be okay. rolled back. Right. Yeah, Quick go ahead. Clarification, yeah. So it's yeah. about eight minutes, not eight blocks. Okay. So once, once you. your transaction is mined, it's a 35 block confirmation, which is like oh, okay. eight, eight and a half minutes. Got it, okay, yeah. Um, so it's minutes, not blocks, gotcha. Go ahead. Yep. So the one of the reasons that this is cheaper is because the voting is no longer happening on chain. When you have a three of five multi-sig, you have to pay for five transactions on chain to have mm. the voting happen on chain. Okay. So this is where you really get the benefit of how white we can be five times cheaper is now we only have to write one transaction to the chain. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So we, we wait for your money to arrive. And then once your money has arrived, we wait 35 block confirmations. Okay. On, the, on the Ethereum side. And then we mint on the Avalanche side. The Avalanche side is almost instantaneous. 
So yeah, but you can see in this GIF, yes. yeah, you see like a block a dot 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 for the eight or nine minutes, and then it's one single confirmation, which is you know a number of seconds or so on the avalanche side, and it really gives you a sense of avalanche consensus is finality is very very fast compared to Nakamoto consensus. As you can see it in this user experience. Yeah, and I want to give a I want to give a shout out to to Julia at, at Ava Labs because she she's one of the designers we have, and she did an absolutely fantastic job uh, designing this. Uh, this new this new bridge and the front end and mm -hmm. it's so much smoother than any other bridge I've used and I'm like so so excited about it I think it's really cool and uh, we've been talking internally about ways to really spice it up to you know introduce people to the ecosystem provide like off ramps for like what to do with your money next sure uh, once you come over as well as trying to make it as easy as possible to get your money in I think we're going to add additional functionality to do uh, Weath convert wrapped ETH conversions in app mm -hmm. and, and some things like that. But I think it looks slick as hell. And oh yeah, I'm for sure. Super excited about it. Okay, so a couple other questions then. Do, what are the multi-chain implication implications? Do you know? Yeah. So right now it's just Avalanche Ethereum. You know, no promises in the mm -hmm. future, but uh, I think other EVM implementations are probably are, are very feasible mm -hmm. uh, because the design is 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 similar. So I. I would imagine that we would do that in the future. I'm also not on the bridge team. I, I, I get this information. Yeah, yeah, know. of course, of course. Yeah, that's why yeah, we're going to have Michael on board. Yeah, uh, do you know, is it EVM centric? Is it, is, it gener is it general enough to where, it, do you, again, I don't expect you to know the final answer on this, but do you think we so, could apply so the, this to other VMs? It's EVM ready for, gotcha. for anything else right now. So the lift to get it over to a different bridge is not huge, to a different chain is not huge. And I think the end goal is, to also have it be non-EVM compatible as well through with, yeah. you know, Bitcoin, Doge, whatever. I'm, I'm very much, the Doge bridge is near and dear to my heart. I think we, I need Doge trading on Avalanche. That's a I very agree. important thing to me. It's available over REN, right? And what do you know about it REN? What, what, how does REN work? And what's the difference between REN and the AEV and the AB? What, what, how, where does it fit in? Okay, Ren is cool. Ren is cool. We're really going deep on bridges here. <laughs> bridges are where I, my whole point after this is I have yeah, this yeah. idea called the bridgening, but I'll get there in a second. So, <laughs> how, how does Ren yeah. work? Yeah. So, so Ren, I have a great thread on Ren uh, if you want to check that out. But basically, Ren is another type of decentralized bridge. Ren is actually one of the most decentralized bridge uh, designs out there. Hmm. And so, they use a kind of multi party comp computation and sharding approach where they let anyone become a bridge relayer, basically. Anyone can participate. It's a trustless protocol. Okay. Uh, or a permissionless protocol, rather, not trustless. And you have to stake a certain amount of REN to join. And the amount of bridge transfers you can approve is actually limited by the amount of REN you're staking. So if it turns out any of your money gets stolen, they can actually slash your staking amount. And the protocol is supposed to like be insured so that uh, no matter like what the breach is, they could always pay it back with the insurance fund. I'm not 100% sure the math adds up there, but that's what they, they promise. Um, and so, yeah, basically they kind of like split transactions into shards. They split these validator groups into shards. The validator groups get shuffled every day. And when a transaction comes in, it has to be verified by the majority of a shard. And then there's actually a second shard, which is a trusted shard, which is composed only of trusted validators. So it's not totally trustless. I think it's uh, the, the trusted validators could not collude themselves to pass transactions. It would require another shard to validate as well, but the trusted validator group could censor transactions. So- And do you know, is there a limit that you have to stake? I guess apparently whatever you're going to. There's a minimum. I'm not, I'm not sure what it is. A minimum, my head. Yeah. yeah. Got it. And are there other, um, so that's three different types of bridges. Are there other bridge design patterns? Yeah. So there's the most common is the lock and mint type of bridge, right? Where you have a collateral that's like locked on one side, and then you mint a new token on the other. Um, so there's kind of like the standard relayer design. Uh, there's the AB design that's also a lock and mint bridge with secure hardware. Mm -hmm. There's also uh, the Ren bridge, which is basically it's also kind of like a relayer bridge, except Anybody can be a relayer. Then there's also other types. Uh, for example, there's uh, liquidity bridges or liquidity pool bridges. 
I don't know if that's the official name for them, but instead mm. of actually like locking tokens on one end and minting on the other, you actually create something like Pangolin where you have liquidity pools on both sides mm. and you have users actually providing liquidity that can be swapped across. So you have a pool of tether tokens on both sides and then there's rewards and you have to pay fees to the liquidity providers for, for making those swaps. The problem with those, the, the good thing about those bridges is they don't require minting new tokens. Mm -hmm. The bad part about those bridges is they don't work well for getting liquidity over in the first place. Because if I want to bring Tether from, you know, or, or you know, from from Ethereum to Avalanche, Tether already has to be on Avalanche to have that kind of bridge solution work. Which it might work for Tether because Tether is integrating with Avalanche. But for mm -hmm. random ERC twenty token X, that's not necessarily going to be the case. That means you need the actual like, you know, you need to work with the actual developer stuff like that. Got it. Okay. Cool. Um, do you have any idea the implications for migrating tokens over? Is there any work involved if people are already using the existing AEB bridge and they want to just start using the new AB bridge? What is involved there? Stay tuned. Uh, there's going to be a migration event where the collateral is moved from the Avalanche Ethereum bridge to the Avalanche bridge, and there will be some one-click solutions that we'll provide for you to convert your uh, convert your tokens from the AB version to the AB version. Got it. And if you're in a liquidity pool like Pangolin, I know the Pangolin team is working on some contracts to help make that and it, as painless as possible. Try to be single click to move from the old pools to the new pools. But Got if it. you are in a DeFi app, you're going to have to take an action. It, it's a painful action. It's going to suck. Mm -hmm. uh, and it affects the whole ecosystem. And yeah. we hate it. But I think we all think that this is a benefit long term for the ecosystem. Yeah, and it's always better to do those kinds of things earlier than later, as we've seen with multiple <laughs> protocols that I've worked on. Protocol ossification, is that the right way to say that? Um, basically, when protocol hardens over time and it's harder to introduce changes over time. So now, yeah, it's going to be a pain for all of these apps to do that, but it's going to be even more painful in a year from now, right? So sometimes it's like the best time to do that was yesterday, the next best time is today, and it gets harder every single day. So yeah, my idea that I've been tossing around um, and I've been saying this for months and at first I thought it was a placeholder name, but now it seems to be kind of the name I'm using, but it's basically this idea of the bridging. And so what I mean by that is there were, I, I myself really got exposed to it when I joined uh, Ava Labs, of course, and I saw the AEB bridge uh, get built and I just had an appreciation. So again, Pangolin was a huge milestone in my opinion. Pangolin was just the very first dApp that really went big in the Avalanche ecosystem and kind of proved to people like, hey, this whole DeFi game that's being played in all these other ecosystems, it works really well in our ecosystem with the sub-second finality and expensive fees and fast throughput, et cetera. And then the bridge. I don't remember the timeline, but I know they were both pretty close to each other. <laughs> and then when the bridge, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, Bridge thought. was Monday, Pangolin was Tuesday. <laughs> there, there you go. That's probably literally true. Um, I remember the very first weekend that the bridge went live or the very first week, I think $100 million or something crazy like that moved over from Ethereum into the Avalanche ecosystem. And so I remember Gun saying at an interview early on when I joined the team, maybe Kevin said it, credit where it's due, that um, they were of the opinion that the EVM was the winner with regards to um, the engine of the, the layer one engine of DeFi. And at the, you know, it took me a time to sort of really appreciate what they were saying. And when I finally got it was when I saw the bridge pop off and Penguin pop off. And what I mean by that is I just realized that there's just so much institutional knowledge now across EVM developer tooling and teams. And there's a lot of money, right? There's a lot of teams who've generated a lot of different assets that have a lot of valuation on all of these different EVM chains. And if you throw up your own instance of the EVM and it has some special sauce for whatever it is, in our case, it happened to be Avalanche Consensus, but there's multiple EVM networks out there that are all booming and they've all got their own special sauce. It, anybody can throw up an EVM, just like anybody can clone any open source software, but it takes a little special sauce to get the network effect. But if you can get that network effect, there's so much institutional knowledge and being able to just take a dap and drop it into the new EVM eco ecosystem and do some minor integration touch points and then have a booming you know, DeFi app, which is all of a sudden, you know, having a ton of volume and a token, which has got some serious trading uh, value is incredibly, incredibly powerful. And it's hard to bootstrap against that. It's hard to compete against that because we proved it with our, uh, our instance of the EVM, which absolutely went crazy. And so um, 
one of the things I've been seeing is that this idea of, of bridges, how important bridges are, and we're moving into this multi-blockchain multi, -blockchain, multi uh, blockchain world. And of course, Avalanche isn't the only platform that's trying to you know, build this multi-blockchain uh, future. There's Polkadot and there's Cosmos and there's many, many others. And they're all filled with amazing people who got their computer science chops down and have raised a bunch of money. Like there's a lot of potential in this space. Somebody's going to solve this problem. And so we're moving into this multi-blockchain world. That's one of the reasons I'm not a maxi because I think we've already proven in the 10 years that crypto has been around, it's not going to be a one, you know, winner takes all type scenario. There's already so many different chains of value and being able to build these bridges to make it easy to move assets in between these networks is incredibly value, uh, valuable. And it goes back to what I'm always saying about compound network effects. Network effects are one thing, but being able to feed network effects back and forth and get compound network effects, that's the ultimate play. And the pattern we're seeing now with all of these EVMs bridge up is a pattern which I suspect will be replicated across all of these other virtual machines. So, you know, today we have the Avalanche virtual machine and it hasn't seen the adoption that the EVM has because it solves a different set of problems. It's really good at peer-to-peer -peer payments, which we're going to talk about here in a second. And I still think peer-to-peer -peer payments is a huge use case that will boom in the future, but it's just not as hot as DeFi right now, whatever. But you can imagine a scenario where somebody launches a subnet with an instance of the AVM and it's popping. And then somebody may even launch their own layer one network that's not even part of Avalanche. And um, it, they may launch their own AVM on their own layer one network and it may be popping. But I suspect as soon as there is a value bearing assets on any of these networks, if you can build bridges between them, you're going to get compound network effects like we have seen between the EVM instances. And so I'm nearly positive that the same pattern we're seeing now where all the EVMs that have value bridge up and it helps them all sort of grow in value in the same way that bridges between cities help cities grow instead of if you burn the bridges down. Um, I think we're going to see that across all of the different virtual machines. And so my question, and I, again, I, I don't expect you to have the answer is, I'm wondering how generic or how general the AB bridges and are we ultimately going to see this used for um, like cross sub chain bridging and cross virtual machine bridging um, again we may need Michael to weigh more in on that but it's something that I've definitely got on my mind I've been so many questions come to me each day what are uh, cross sub chain transfers going to look like and they're definitely on our roadmap and I'm wondering is this going to be part of that technology stack or will there be even more things I'm not entirely sure myself yeah so this is this is a really interesting question it, it... It, I, it's, it comes down to kind of our platform team and like what we can come up with. And I think that kind of the, the sky's the limit for, for our creativity here. My personal hope is that we don't need the, a bridge, so to speak, to, to actually move cross, cross subnet or cross VM within Avalanche. Um, I don't know how this would work. I'm like, you know, speculating here. I'm not, uh, not lecturing, but, uh, because the, we, you you potentially be able to share validators, every, the, the people that are running subnets would be running Avalanche Go at some level. They might not be validating every chain, but because they're validating the peach chain, or you, know, or you might be able to have enough people who are actually validating both chains that you want to bridge between that you could have some of them act as your Oracle and then do like a zero knowledge proof or something like that, or a verifiable computation proof that says they've like done the cross chain transfer uh, and then kind of distribute that to all of the validators that are not validating both chains. And so you can kind of just like bake the bridge into your validator set or something like that. I think that's the, like the way that I would personally try to go rather than actually having to like bootstrap bridges between each subnet. I'd rather see it if we had just this series of infrastructure, like uh, how, processors have, you know, inter-process communication and just these networking layers just built into your PC rather than having to like, you know, kind of strap on, uh, you know, physical networking, uh, you know, into your, your individual PC. Like, can we take advantage of the shared layers of the ecosystem to make cross-chain import exports of anything possible? Because we do it for the X chain and the C chain and the P chain now. So what would that look to generalize that? And that's something that I don't know. I'm not really a super expert on the platform side. So I'd, I'd need to seek out some guidance for that. Yeah, actually, I have heard brainstorms on something similar. And that actually gives me the insight that I was missing. I have heard about uh, having the validators. So yeah, what I have heard brainstorms on, and this isn't something that's... Um, 
uh, on the official roadmap or anything that I don't even think this was internal. I think I've just heard people brainstorming on what this is going to look like. And something I have heard brainstorming on as well, since we've already got the P chain validators are validating the X and the C chain, maybe a similar pattern could be followed there. So I think that's similar to what you're describing. So yeah, that's an interesting idea. I had not considered that. Okay, very cool. Um, yeah, I think that's it with the AB bridge. Any last thoughts before we move on to the next topic? Yeah, if you're interested in bridging, tune in in a couple of weeks when Michael's back on, because there's there's still way more. <laughs> yeah, there <laughs> we is. We can go deeper, more. and I you know I'm not an expert on bridging. I just I just read about it and think about it. Michael's actually been building bridges for two years, so I I can't wait to just uh, poke him and uh, mm -hmm. have him tell me how wrong I am. <laughs> yeah. So the next one is also hugely exciting. So Chainlink data feeds are now live on the Avalanche uh, testnet and mainnet. And so basically this provides reliable tamper-proof inputs and outputs for complex smart contracts. And I know that already there are price feeds for a bunch of different uh, pairs of tokens against Avox and maybe tokens against each other. I'm not sure of the fine details. I suspect Connor knows a ton more about this. So yeah, I'm gonna pass the mic to you. So I guess let's approach this at a super high level. You know, why do we even need oracles? What problem do they solve? What is, what are, and then, you know, drill in, like, what do we expect to accelerate adoption of now on mainnet? What has this prevented us from having? And what is, what are we now going to see pretty much? Yeah, sure. So oracles, uh, if you don't know, are basically entities that sit off chain and look at data in the rest of the world over the internet or, you know, via our thermometer, whatever. They surveil the, the rest of the world and they take that data and they encode it on the blockchain for the rest of us to use. Because when you're on the blockchain, because we have these like strict consensus requirements that every block or sorry, every validator must have the exact same view of the world, we have to agree on all of the information that gets encoded on chain. And so you can't just like download a website be front and have that be part of your on-chain data because you don't necessarily know if everyone in the world is going to have the same result when they go fetch that website. Some people might get a 404. Some people might be banned in their country. Some people, the packet might get dropped and then some people will get the right answer. So because you have these like differing views of the same thing, you can't encode that information at a protocol layer. So instead you need these oracles to be trusted parties basically to fetch that data for you and put it on chain. So if I want to know something like sports results, uh, I will have to ask an Oracle who won the Super Bowl, and the Oracle will tell me, uh, you know, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, but so how, how is this data encoded? Just real quickly, how, can you do like structured data, or is this the hash of data, or what exactly are you getting back? So you could do you could do anything you want. So so basically, it has to be pre-decided. So you have to. Uh, know what you're asking for. You can't just ask for an arbitrary thing. You actually, the Oracle has a smart contract that it puts on chain. And you basically say, I want you to write the answer here in this box. And then the Oracle comes and puts the information in that box. So you can just go check that box later and say, okay, this is what the Oracle wrote. And if I, I, I've done some digging into Chainlink's actual API. And so basically they can return like any kind of standard data type. They can return you like a string, a byte, array uh, or a number or a boolean or something like that um and they have different things to like parse json and, and whatnot but the most common thing that oracles are used for are price feeds that's the most popular use case and for now and i suspect that's because DeFi is the most popular use case thing happening right now right but i suspect since you can yeah, pull absolutely. in anything it could be used for pretty much anything mm -hmm. and this is something that uh trips some people up and there's definitely been a lot of attacks uh, through this vector over the years. And it's using insecure price feeds for computing values in your DeFi protocol. So lending, for example, is the, is the most common uh, example of what needs oracles. So to do, um, so what, sometimes what people will do to get a price feed is they'll go to something like Pangolin and they'll say, what's the current Pangolin price? Because if, as a user, if you go to Pangolin, Pangolin's prices are always spot on because there's people who are arbitraging in the background and that's such a huge money maker. Those prices are just always arbitrage to be you know, within you know, a very small percentage of the actual price. Um, so you might think my app can go look and check what the Pangolin price of this pair is and then use that for my price feed. Uh, but it turns out there's these things called flash loans, which 
uh, allow users to borrow collateral free. They can borrow as much money as the DeFi protocol that they're borrowing from has in their treasury. You could literally borrow a billion dollars without any, uh, without any collateral backing it. And the reason you can do this is you have to pay it back all at once uh, or within the same transaction. So these transactions follow a commit revert pattern. If you can't pay your flash loan back, your uh, transaction will fail and revert. But if you can pay it back, then you can borrow as much money as you want. And so what people will do is they will take a flash loan and they will use their billion dollars that they just borrowed to change the price on a DEX. They'll buy up all of the pang the you know the PNG tokens there are and totally raise the price of, of PNG. So now when I go to look at what's the price of PNG, it's going to be wrong. And so that has led to a lot of protocols draining their money. So that's the kind of problem that Oracles and you know like Chainlink in particular tries to solve is these secure price feeds that have a decentralized source. So the other thing you have to worry about with Oracles is that you want to make sure the Oracle is not the person running the person running the oracle is not the same person as the person running your the your app because if it's a sports gambling app or something like that you you might ask the oracle to give you the right response who won the super bowl and the person running the app or, also has money on the line so they'll just actually give you the answer that uh, allows them to win money so there's some things you have to be careful about uh, you have to make sure that you're choosing good oracles but chainlink has as good a reputation as, as anyone and i i would say from my vetting them, their price feeds are pretty much as good as there is. Um, and what right what now. what defense mechanisms do they have in place, or how do they gather their price feed? How do they prevent their price feed from being gamed from from external parties? So so as far as I understand, the they have a decent they have what they call decentralized oracle networks, uh, which is they basically have a group of people validating each price feed, and currently. That group is a trusted group. Uh, you, there is not just a path for any user to become a uh, to become a, a, an oracle in their in their network. Uh, you have to be kind of like hand selected. They mostly work off of reputation, uh, just kind of the chain link ecosystem in general. And so they have at least twenty one nodes, I think, validating each price feed. And the way they work mostly is there's a deviation threshold. So whenever a price moves by a certain percent, so like say 0.5%, uh, any one of the nodes in the network can trigger a rewrite where they will recompute uh, the price, vote on it, and then the median price that gets voted on is written on chain. And then there's also a heartbeat. So if you go more than 24 hours without a price update, they will write it in. So you're relying on at least 21 nodes that are kind of like handpicked by Chainlink which you're still trusting Chainlink. You're still trusting that they know how to pick their Oracle operators, but um, it's, it's probably as good a security as you can get right now. And are there other, there must be competitors to Chainlink. Who are the other big players? Uh, there's a few. Augur, I think has some okay. Oracle solution. I think MakerDAO is working on something as well. I'm not totally familiar with the whole, whole space, but sure. uh, Chainlink is here now. They're on Avalanche. They're the first Oracle to really come to Avalanche. And if you're mm -hmm. using their price feeds, I would recommend you use them. And if you're using their other uh, data feeds, I think that they're also great to use. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that Chainlink is arriving now is because uh, the official link token that you will use to pay for your link requests is the Avalanche bridge version of the link token. Ah, okay. Got it. So that was a big milestone. I see. And so now, so what, so what has not been able to launch? Cause I'm, there's been a bunch of projects that I've been on biz dev calls with and they've been like, we need oracles. Do you guys have them? And we've been like, not yet. So what have we not had yet? And what should we now expect to sort of see? Lending. Lending. Okay. Got lending, it. Which, lending, which lending. is, which huge. It's absolutely freaking huge. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It's one of the top two, top two apps on any ecosystem is going to be your Dex and your lending protocol. Got it. So there will be multiple lending protocols launching on Avalanche. Very Is there soon. anything announced yet or no? Thank you, Finance. Thank you, Finance. Okay. And that's huge. That's definitely huge. They're doing like big, big numbers. Yeah, they're Avalanche native. Uh, oh, they're so Avalanche so native. Okay. I thought that was a coming over from the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm, I'm wrong, but I misunderstood. Okay. No, I believe they're Avalanche native. Got um, it. Okay, cool. And that's, that's all I can say for now. But there's multiple coming. Sure. Yeah, I'm sure there is. Okay, very exciting. 
Yeah, Chainlink's huge. They've been, um, I know, I think even before I joined the team, there was talks about Chainlink. And I know Sergey and Goon are like both two legendary block stars, and I see them all, all the time together in memes. And one of the questions I, I want to ask Goon whenever I eventually have a chance to chat with him is like, what's it, what does it feel like being a living meme? And I would like to ask the same question of Sergey. Like, I wonder, do they do they think it's absurd? Do they think it's funny? Do they show their family? Like half the stuff I see, I don't even, I can't even make sense of it. It's all so far out there at these points. And I just wonder, like, what do they think of that? You know, they, these guys are hardcore computer scientists. You know what I mean? And I wonder what it feels like to break into the zeitgeist in that way and to become a living being. Because those guys have definitely hit that level. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've talked to him about it. I've seen, he's, he's shown me some things that are, there's one in picture in particular, which I don't want to mention because I know he doesn't want to share it publicly. Sure. But it was really good and really funny. <laughs> hey, I know he collects the good ones, but some of the stuff he's also, I know he's been weirded out by. <laughs> but there yeah. have been, he's like, there have been some good ones over the years. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Wow, man, time is flying. I think we started like 35 or 40 minutes ago. Okay, so yeah, let's- uh, So let's yeah. go through the, yeah, the other- Yeah, the other let's get through this quick. stuff. They're not as big. Got it. So yeah, one thing we just announced is that we are having a dev contest. So um, we are having a, uh, we set aside $50,000 as a prize pool to basically incentivize developers to create uh, tutorials and documentation for the Avalanche network. And so um, myself and Connor sit through a ton of biz dev calls. And one of the universal things uh, that I hear is that the barrier to entry for the Avalanche tech stack is very high. I myself experienced it as I was on ramping into the team and everybody sort of experiences the same thing. There's a lot of moving pieces in the Avalanche ecosystem. Um, once you learn them all, it really is like having magic powers and you can do amazing things, but there's no question with subnets and virtual machines and multiple virtual machines on our primary subnet and different consensus and there's there's a lot going on and even if you're coming just, just quick yeah. interruption do you remember what it was like when we had to do manual import exports from the x chain to the c chain uh manual before like, we had the wallet tool oh god yeah before whenever we had to use avalanche go basically yeah you had to use the Avalanche Go uh, <laughs> yeah. using postman calls on the X chain and the C chain. It took me like an hour to figure out how to do it the first time. This was like mm -hmm. right when I started. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just like, I was like, hey, I need some Avox to, to do some testing. And they're like, well, I can send you X chain Avox. I'm like, well, I need C chain Avox. Mm -hmm. How do I get that? And they're like, I, I have no clue. <laughs> Yeah, I do remember that quite well, because I'm like a whale on Fuji, and I've done that for so many different teams, and you're right, before we had the wallet to do that, doing this through the command line, and then waiting, and making sure you didn't screw up in some way was just a tedious, nightmare, error-prone thing, so... Um, yeah, so basically like we want to incentivize people to help create tutorials because we know that we want to on-ramp as many people into the ecosystem as possible. It's life-changing when you actually get the proper tool for something and it goes from being like an arduous process to just like, oh, I don't even have to think about this. This isn't even a thing. And that's, I think, just like our goal of like, sure. we want to make it, we want to take that and apply it to every piece of the ecosystem, not right. just the, the pieces that are super developer heavy. It's like going from Vim or Emacs to like the Macintosh, right? So it was like that big leap forward from whenever they introduced the GUI at Xerox Park or whatever. And the first time Jobs and Wozniak saw it and they were like, oh, okay, I understand. It's about abstraction and about making things easier. It's like, why can one-year-olds or two-year-olds understand how an iPhone works and swipe and tap? Because it's all about abstracting away all that, that complexity behind, you know, simplicity and intuition. And so, yeah, anytime you can take a tool from being a command line postman tool to being a web GUI tool is like a thousand X leap forward. And so um, in the context of this development contest, I want to give a shout out to Sochil and uh, Jovica, two amazing uh, people on our team who've been really driving this. I myself have set through a bunch of brainstorm sessions, but they really deserve the credit for uh, driving this home. So as I mentioned, we have a $50,000 prize pool and we have two rounds of submission. The first one is um, August 2nd through August 23rd. And then the second one is August 31st through the 7th. So the way this works is we're doing different categories, smart contracts, tokens, DeFi, NFTs, as you can imagine, kind of the traditional stuff we're uh, working with in our ecosystem. But we have three different tiers of prizes, 1,000, 2,000, and 3,000. If you submit a tutorial and it makes it through to round two, you automatically get $1,000. And then if you win one of the secondary prizes, it'll be one, two, or $3,000. 
And so, as I mentioned, um, the contest is open now. We've extended the round one submission date for two weeks, so it ends on the 23rd. If you are uh, a developer and you've been working in the Avalanche ecosystem, you probably already have a lot of this captured in notes or workflows. I myself do this all day long. I try and create, create a markdown document for every single thing I do just for myself later so I can uh, save myself time later when I'm redoing stuff. If you want to take that stuff and you want to port it over and try and get it into our documentation, we're incentivizing with, you know, a thousand, two or three thousand dollars. And I encourage everybody to please check that out. Uh, something that Connor and I mentioned uh, whenever we talked a couple weeks ago is I'm going to I have all the links here. I'm going to add them into the uh, description at the bottom whenever we upload this to YouTube. And also something else I discovered how to do since we last talked is how to break up the timeline into chapters. So whenever I upload this, this will have chapters in the timeline to make it easier to deep link or digest and consume as well as these links. So I encourage you guys to go check out the dev contest. And then lastly, another thing I wanted to mention is that shopping.io recently announced you can now shop at eBay, Etsy, Walmart, and Amazon and use um, basically Avox to buy, uh, buy things on those sites. And so I think that's very exciting for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, I think people are uh, not fully appreciating the ability of Avox to be peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. So again, I think P2P electronic cash is a huge use case. It's the thing that blew Bitcoin up in the very beginning. It never really reached its full fruition for whatever reason in the Bitcoin ecosystems. And then DeFi and smart contracts and tokenomics just became so huge that they've really drowned it out the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, payment game. And plus peer-to-peer -peer payments aren't as exciting. Uh, another way to say this is, in 2008, 2009, 2010, when you first used Bitcoin, there really weren't a lot of mobile apps then. There weren't really a lot of banking, uh, mobile integration point of sale type things. The banking industry and traditional finance has really caught up to where peer-to-peer -peer payments were in 2008, 2009, but it's still a hugely, hugely, hugely uh, game-changing idea of being able to send any amount of money to anybody anywhere in the world, you know, no middleman, nearly for free and nearly instantly. Um, I, I think that idea really has legs and I think there's still a lot of room to grow there. And so I think right now people think of Avalanche, at least a lot of people from the outside who don't appreciate all of the different innovations we're offering as an Ethereum killer is obviously something we've heard a trillion times, even though we definitely do not market ourselves in that way. But Avalanche, because it's of its very um, general nature and the ability to create different virtual machines that have different properties, also can do peer-to-peer -peer payments really well. And we can see that today in our X chain, which does peer-to-peer -peer payments and simple tokens very well, um, super high throughput, thousands of transactions per second. It does not have full smart contract, well, smart contracting, let's call it light smart contracting like Bitcoin has. So there's no pay to script hash and pay to pub key hash, but it does have time lock and it does have multi-sig. And during my time at Bitcoin.com, just seeing the types of traffic we were seeing and our different biz dev partners and what people were actually using Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin for, um, simple payments and simple tokens are a huge play there. Not every single token needs to be full on ERC-20 or full... Um, uh, ERC721 for NFTs. There are other simpler types of tokens that can be used in payment use cases or for mileage points, or, you know, there's a thousand use cases there. Um, today, the fees on the um, X chain are, I believe, they are hard coded, um, but they will also be dynamic in the future. So, in a similar way, we're going to on ramp dynamic fees onto the C chain and make things a lot more reasonable. It will be like that in the future. And then also, if you need smart contract smart contracting capabilities, which are not currently offered on the uh, AVM. The AVM is very general a purpose, the very general in nature, and you can plug in different feature extensions. And there is the potential to create some type of smart contracting in a feature extension. It might be a little bit harder to land in the actual X chain, which is live on the default subnet without a, it would require a hard fork, but you can always launch your own instance of the AVM on your own subnet if this is functionality you need. And then also, if it's not something you can fit into the uh, AVM, you can launch your own virtual machine. And so I really just raised uh, this shopping.io announcement because we see so many announcements in our ecosystem that have to do with tokens and DeFi, and that's all incredibly exciting and innovative. But I also still like peer-to-peer -peer payments. And this reminded me of, it would have been around the time of the Ethereum uh, yellow paper. So I guess 2015-ish. I was living on Kauai at the time and I had, um, I had BTC. 
and I, I don't remember the, I'm sure somebody who was around at the time knows what I'm talking about, but there was a gift card service. There was like an app that you could download to your phone and you could get gift cards. And I remember one time I had an apartment on Kauai and I went down to the local Target, I think it was. And um, again, the, these numbers are sort of fuzzy in my mind at this point, but there was a cap you could get on each card, let's say 200 bucks or something like that. And I remember I went down there and I think I had eight cards on my phone because I was, you know, I was going to just deck out the full apartment that day. And so we show up to the counter. We've got, you know, like four carts full of stuff and the guy starts ringing stuff up and I'm handing him, you know, scan my phone 200 bucks at a time. And they actually had to bring over the manager because at first they kind of <laughs> thought I was like a hacker or something. And I figured this out. This guy stole these. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, initially they were like, well, well, what's this all about? Eight different cards. And I'm like, no, man, Bitcoin. And, you know, you could tell their vibe. In the beginning, there was always the vibe of is Bitcoin like World of Warcraft bucks or is it scam coin? Right. And you could tell initially these people's vibe were like Bitcoin was Bitcoin, but <laughs> they took it and they didn't give any hassle, fortunately. But this reminds me of that. I think that. Um, Again, DeFi and tokens, all those things are incredibly powerful. And you know, I'm a huge advocate, but I'm also just a huge advocate of peer-to-peer -peer payments. And the reason I say that is not because fiat doesn't do its job well, but I don't like inflation. And I don't like people's purchasing power to just be robbed out from under them every year just by the fact that there's more and more money printed. So the more and more commerce we can move into these um, new paradigms, Avox being one of them, I personally just think that's a really big deal. And so I think this is a very exciting milestone. Any thoughts? Yeah, I know it's awesome. You know, say the only thing I don't like people are really into this deflationary currency mm -hmm. stuff. So <laughs> has more value over time. The the bad thing about it is it really disincentivizes you from actually spending your money because right. that makes it so that like if I any money I spent now could be worth more later, and yeah. I can't buy a pizza tonight because that might turn into millions of dollars down the line. That's where the hodl mentality comes, right? Like you're like, yeah, you'd, yeah. You'd, you'd be dumb to spend it now. It's worth more in the future. And I think the counterbalance of that is spend and replace, right? Like this, this is that typical argument, but yeah, I agree. But then that also just kind of changes the way we approach money. We respect our money more and we want to save it more, which is probably the wise choice anyway. Right. So I think that that ultimately it's a good pattern to probably pick up. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, it, but it's interesting on the, it's different also for the individual and for the economy, right? Because mm -hmm. I think there's like the macro force of like, you know, we've just been conditioned, you know, like the way that our world is operated is people like spend, spend, spend. Mm -hmm. And so now if people just hold, hold, hold. What does that do for businesses? What does that do for, for everything? Mm -hmm. And was, it's interesting. I'm, I'm not an economist. I don't know how all that shakes out, but it, it's I, one of the coolest things about crypto is that People are just launching like macroeconomic experiments mm -hmm. like all the time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that is probably the greatest thing. So some of the great things have been part of the Bitcoin and crypto journey for me. Number one, just personal financial sovereignty, really having an awareness of money and wealth today that I just simply did not have when I was you know, 10 or 15 years ago. That's been huge. And every single person who comes into the space, not everybody, but nearly universally, there's that common experience where people start to understand money better. They start to understand fiat currency better. They start to understand inflation better. But another great thing is simply that prior to cryptocurrencies, money was really a monopoly held by the the government of your local jurisdiction. So if you don't like US dollars, well, that's kind of tough. You can maybe use a Forex market and get some Canadian dollars, but they're not going to accept it whenever you go buy your groceries or you pay your taxes. And still, you can't pay your taxes with crypto in every country, but you can in some, you know, like El Salvador, for example. But um, the great thing, one of the many, many great things about cryptocurrency is that it's made money. It's made money a market in the sense that now it uh, has innovation and competition. And innovation, you know, competition always drives innovation. And so that's just a big win and I, and I understand why central banks are now focused on cryptocurrencies and I understand why my intuition is that future future central currencies will be CBDCs and I think the one we see being baked in China will probably be a template for ones that are rolled out around the world simply because even central banks even with the ability to force you to pay taxes in your local currency they all have to compete now because everybody's escaping their wealth out of these fiat currencies anybody who has wealth to save not everybody does everybody has to you know bills and all that stuff I understand but for people who do in fact have savings or assets Many, many, many smart people are moving their assets out of traditional fiat type environments into these new deflationary currencies and they're understanding the upside. 
right? Like when you go to the bank and the bank's like, man, when you have too much cash in your account, you should let us put that cash to work for you. We could get you a two to 4% over the next year. And then you're like, yeah, well, D5. Dude, I get 1% a day. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Like D5, have you checked out D5? So it's just, it changes the game and it's going to cause competition, which is ultimately going to benefit everybody in my personal opinion. Okay, got it. So it has been literally like, I think 50 minutes now. Um, I want to be super respectful of your time. So first off, let's just wrap it up. Those, there's a lot of news that's happening in, a, in the ecosystem. That, those were just four topics that I had raised that I wanted to discuss with Connor. Um, we had talked about also potentially deep diving on NFTs, but it's been an hour and I want to be respectful of your time. I'll leave that up to you if you want to keep going, yeah, if you I, want I to call it. Okay, cool. So yeah, we wanted to then um, jump over to an other, another topic and that is just deep diving on NFTs. So as we mentioned, when we chatted a couple weeks ago, myself and Connor have been super involved in um, building a, an NFT, like a premier white label sort of NFT marketplace. Connor, I know you can articulate it better than myself. And there's a lot of stuff that still has yet to be announced um, that is on the roadmap there. Incredibly exciting stuff that's happening. And then there's just a lot of other stuff that's happening in the NFT ecosystem, such as generative NFTs and some other items. So I'll let you take over, Connor. Yeah, I think NFTs are one of the most exciting use cases of crypto right now. I think DeFi is number one as far as, you know, where where is the money going? It's going to DeFi right now. NFTs are also super exciting. I think that's probably the number two use case. I don't think those will be the only like two use cases going forward. I think especially like identity is the big one that's going to be coming up and, and more popular. But right now, NFTs are hot and NFTs show up in so many different places. Uh, they show up as indie artwork you know support creators kind kind of kind of nfts there's also these generative meme nfts like crypto punks or uh even crypto kitties um and now we're even seeing games that are very nft nft based like axie infinity and i think that last category of game nft integrations is absolutely huge axie has blown up and it's going to revolutionize gaming in, in so many ways. Yeah. Please school so, me a bit more on that. I'm not entirely sure how that one works. Yeah, 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 sure. So let's talk about Axie for a minute. I personally have not played Axie. I'm trying to, my, my girlfriend is cautioning me against uh, diving in because it's, it's not cheap to play. Uh, the intro cost is about a minimum of a thousand dollars right now. And is that um, a, because of fees or is that simply because that's what it costs to get the, the primitives to play? So to start playing, you need three axes and you have to buy these axes from the marketplace. I don't know where the original Genesis axes came from. And axes is what? What exactly is an axes? So they're like Pokemon. Okay, got it. Uh, so it's like a trading card battle game or but not actually cards, but you know, uh, axie trading uh, and then battle games. So there's like an adventure mode. Then there's like a player versus player mode, I think. But basically, it's also kind of like a derivative of CryptoKitties, where you can breed these Pokemon, you can breed these Axies, you can mate them, and you can get characteristics, and some of them will have rare characteristics. And there's a marketplace for these guys. And if you so guys remember, in, yeah, real quick, so if you guys remember, the backstory there is that CryptoKitties was really like, as, as I remember, I'm sure there were other sort of um, tokens like this that blew up. But as I remember, CryptoKitties was sort of like the first, is it an NFT? Is CryptoKitties technically an NFT? Yeah, they're NFTs. Yeah, so it was the first NFT marketplace that I remember that really, DAP, I'm, again, the words escape me here, that blew up and people have used it as a pejorative term to insult Ethereum for as long as I've been around. People always, oh yeah, Ethereum's so great that CryptoKitties broke it. But of course, I see things slightly different than that. I saw it as, well, CryptoKitties was so incredibly popular that it was one of the first things to go viral to sort of push the limits of the Ethereum ecosystem and kind of show where the bottlenecks were. And so again, um, to sort of walk into what these axes were, CryptoKitties were basically like a generative type game where you could breed kitties and then each subsequent generation took, I presume, some genes from each parent and then had some maybe emergent characteristics and that there were certain rarities and that they sold um, they resold for like really, really large amounts of money early on. And then there's been derivatives of that idea, CryptoKitties, and then is, is CryptoPunks sort of similar in similar vein? Yeah, so CryptoKitties were always more of a game. CryptoPunks are, there, there's no, not like the mating features. CryptoPunks, it's just like 
there's like a thousand of these guys. They all look slightly different. Some characteristics are more rare than others. And so you kind of just buy one. You don't know what you're going to get when you buy them like at, at Genesis. And then now there's just a secondary marketplace and people love throwing them in their profile picture. So if you're on Twitter, if you're on crypto Twitter, you'll see a bunch of people with these kind of like pixel art animated punks. <laughs> and they resell for large amounts of money. Like I recently saw one of them sold for a 650 Ethereum or something, you know, a relatively large amount of money. And so I just gave a presentation last week on NFTs beyond digital art. So this is fresh on my brain. And so a big pushback people get of NFTs is, well, why would I want to give you $100,000 for a JPEG? I can just go right click on your Twitter account and get access to the JPEG. Well, that's because I'm of the opinion that the JPEGs are just the first iteration of this technology and that this is going to go scale much, much farther than this. So one of the use cases I give, and this is extrapolating pretty far out there, but that's the kind of guy I am. Um, I'm a big fan of 3D printers, and I know 3D printers are going to be absolutely, absolutely transformative, and not just the desktop stuff you see today that you know can print little plastic stuff in one color. But we're talking about like full-on molecular-scale nano 3D printing is going to be a thing within our lifetimes, and so you can imagine a scenario in the future where you actually want to print your NFTs. And so you can imagine a scenario where like only the person who literally has a phone or a mobile device of some type that can prove ownership of that particular NFT is able to print it. That's just one small example. But the point simply being there that like today you may be paying for a JPEG, but really what you're paying for is the intellectual property around that item. So recently I saw a back and forth on Twitter about somebody bought an NFT and then printed a bunch of posters and the original artist was like, hey, hold up, that's my art. And the guy was like, hold up, no, it's not. I bought the NFT from you. And that opens a whole can of worms. Well, did he? Well, did he not? I suspect the answer was, well, it depends what the license, the deal was with the license when you purchased it. Yeah, right? if you, I, I will say if you do go, we did have to go through this for, for tops. You, when you buy an NFT through the marketplace, if you go look on IPFS at the actual NFT metadata, there is a terms and conditions. You know, so if you buy a picture of Bazooka Joe, you do not own the rights to Bazooka Joe, the character. Yeah, so I see, I suspect that'll be ironed out and um, that'll, that'll be boilerplate that'll be baked into the IPFS hash, like you just said. So that's cool. Yeah, I'm not surprised that that was covered because all the bases are covered. Okay, so to get back on track. So then there's like CryptoKitties, which is, you said CryptoKitties is more like a game, a game in- Yeah, it's regard. a bit of a game because there's that breeding aspect where you Got can it. like mate them. Got it. And so- um, so CryptoPunks is different. And do you know if, if, if the artists who created the CryptoPunks, are they, um, do they get to decide in advance what all 10 of them look like? Or is there also a generative process with regards to the way that they're sort of spit out? I think, I think it's kind of algorithmic. Like I think what they do is they create the, like the templates mm -hmm. of like, this is what a face looks like. They're, these are the sure. different like skin tones. Mm -hmm. These are like you know, the hat modifiers the like cigarette pipe eye patch modifiers. And then they just kind of like randomly run them through an algorithm. Mm -hmm. It's like generate me 10,000 of these that all have different combinations where these different attributes will occur with like varying rarities. Do you remember the name of the guy who created CryptoKitties or the team? I don't remember. Wasn't it Dapper? Dapper Labs? I I'm not sure. I know there, I, I remember when I was in Tokyo one time, I told this story once before. Um, when I was in Tokyo and I got to meet Jihan Wu, I was with Roger Rivera and he took me backstage to, at this Future of Money conference thing to meet Jihan for like five minutes real quick, you know, hey, how's it going type thing. And on the way back, I remember there is a crypto advocate in Tokyo named Miss Bitcoin and she was hanging in the hallway with the guy. I thought Roger introduced me to him as the guy who created Crypto Kitties, but I could be oversimplifying that. But I believe I did meet at least one of the guys who was on the team. To Again, very quick, like, hey, how's it going, man? I love your work. But I met him very briefly. As I remember, they might have even went on to launch their own layer one network. Is that true? Did they launch their own chain? So I believe, I'm pretty sure it's Dapper. So they're the people who are behind NBA Top Shot now. Okay, got it. Which runs on Flow, which I don't know. Yeah, that's what it is, Flow. Flo. Okay, yeah, that's what it was, yeah. Flow. I thought Flow was help, was at least, again, maybe I'm either misremembering or sort of butchering what I learned. But yes, as I remembered it, the guys who created Crypto Kitties went on to work on Flow. Maybe they just helped design it or maybe they launched their first dApp. Okay, so Dappers is the, is Dappers live on Avalanche? It is, right? Or they're building No, something? no, Dapper Labs, so they're, they're a company. That, so they do, they run NBA Top Shot now, which runs on Flow. Got it, okay, got it. Thank you. NBA Top Shot, another one of the like biggest apps in all of crypto. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, so then to steer it back on track, so then the axes thing. So um, as you described it as something, let's say like Pokemon or magic, is it that kind of thing? Like a uh, what we might boil down to like a, a playing card game in the real world? Yeah, I think it's it's kind of like, I think there's like turn-based battling. I haven't played it, so I'm not 100% sure. Sure. But yeah, so you kind of collect, you breed, you battle. Mm -hmm. And I think there's some like adventure mode, but there's also like a PvP mode, I think. And Got it. so- as part of the playing, you get to create new axes. And because you create these new axes, the axes sell for at least two or $300. Like that's like the bare minimum you can buy them for right now. Mm -hmm. So this kind of enables new play to earn models where if you front the startup capital, you can play this game. And as you play it more and more, you make more axes. You can sell these axes. Mm -hmm. You don't have to keep them yourself and you can actually potentially earn some money. And I've definitely seen some people be like, you can definitely earn more than minimum wage just playing this game. Oh, sure. And imagine, yeah, so there's multiple things that immediately come to mind there. So number one is being able to build up your characters and then sell them. Because there's some people who have more time than money and there's some people who have more money than time, right? And that's the way some of these markets break down. So there's always going to be somebody who, like he said, is going to make more money doing this than minimum wage anyway. And they're doing what they love to do, play games with their friends. And then at the end of the day, they can perhaps build up this character, build up this skill set, build up the levels and then sell that off to somebody who has more money than time, right? Some people don't have that much time, but they sure would love to have a really uh, powerful axes and they can come in and purchase that. So that offers, um, like he said, a potential way for people to play to get paid. And then another way I see this playing out is, so one of the big, big scams that I've seen recently multiple times go down is people buying fake Pokemon cards so I think, um, I'm trying to think who it was recently, my son, I was talking to this with my son who's 12 and he was saying one of the, you know, like one of the influencer kind of, kind of people he knows about online recently got involved in something where there was like a huge Pokemon deal that went down and either the boxes were empty or the cards were counterfeit. I don't remember exactly what it was, but there was something like, yeah, when it all went down at the end of the day, the people who bought the cards really got screwed over in a big way. That stuff won't happen, of course, if you're using NFTs and they're all, you know, verifiable on the blockchain. So this changes the nature of collectibles and collectibles are huge. Um, you know, collectibles are like the canonical example of an NFT that have gone way back to the very beginning. You know, what is an NFT? What an NFT could be like a collectible. And we know that people really love collectibles, even if they, um, only makes sense to that person in the context of their life sometimes that's what makes a collectible special right people collect d like pins and different things like this that really don't have a ton of value to everybody else but it matters to me because every year when i go to this place with me with my mom we always get that pin to signify you know our vacation together every yeah. year that kind of thing collectibles are really 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 valuable to some people and so yeah um and it NFT plays into the, the profile picture game like this is the mm -hmm. whole thing on on twitter now everybody has the their profile picture is their their crypto punk or whatever and so i saw sure. some some tweets the other day of like asking like what's the most affordable like under 200 dollar entry mm -hmm. point for like an nft like this mm -hmm. um because there's also the apes uh i, I forget what the those are called the crypto mm -hmm. apes or whatever that's another popular one yeah but one thing one thing i will caution you if you do want to put that in your profile picture you will dox your wallet <laughs> because if somebody just, if you can like look up what image in the, or what number in the sequence that that NFT is, mm -hmm. then I can just tell if you own CryptoPunk number 1072, I can just look up the wallet address who owns 1072 and I got your wallet. Got it. So does it say in the actual image, the number? So I can look at, or no, do you have, does not. You have, so how do you, how do you reverse engineer from the picture to the number? Uh, so one, you could try doing like, if there was like a reverse Google image search or something like that, there's probably websites that have dumped them all. The other thing you could do is you could actually just manually go through these things. Like there's not a lot of them mm -hmm. realistically that like, I don't know, maybe there's 10,000, but like 10,000 is not a, a big number in computing terms. I could actually just look up all of the images for these NFTs and then just find the one that matches. Got it. And I know there's been several, um, Projects like this have, that have launched on Avalanche. I'm trying to think of some. I know Avox Cells is like a uh, game that launched on Avalanche. I know Snowflakes is also a marketplace. Uh, it, Snowies. Snowies. Snowies is a marketplace as well. Are there any others that come to mind that you know? I want yeah, to some Snowies, Crypto Seals. Crypto Seals, of course. And then uh, Cubetarium. Mm -hmm. And then what else? Uh, there was a dog one. Um, 
I actually helped this guy out. Uh, what, what the hell is it called? Um, I don't remember, but yeah. I, I sure, it'll come, to, it'll come to your mind. Uh, that's the one that I thought was, that's the one that I thought was Dapper. Yeah, that's the one that I thought was Dapper's. That's why I asked you. Is da so Dapper's. No, okay, Dapper not, not, that's not Dapper Labs. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I helped that developer with, with some stuff. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, Dapper's is one. Mm. Uh, okay, very cool. Um, got it. Okay, so I know we wanted to talk about um, potentially, like I said, there's a lot going on with the uh, other existing work. Is there anything you can say about the existing, um, any other NFT work that's going on that you want to bring up? Yeah, I mean, I just think that there's been a huge, I don't remember if I said, I might have said this on the other podcast, but I'll repeat myself. Please. Uh, there's There's been a huge emphasis on NFTs as the, way to save the arts or, or whatever you know that's like the creator economy the creator economy in crypto is mm. nfts mm. and it's all about the individual and i'm just going to say maybe that's a part of the nft space because like boy that's not gonna be the only part of the nft space because companies are coming licenses are coming sure and this is something that uh is definitely going to change about the space Mm -hmm. You know, we've seen this with Bazooka Joe. There's going to be no more announcements in the future of companies that want to participate because mm -hmm. they can, you know, use their brands and use their licenses that are already you know, the most popular brands and licenses in the world. Sure. Um, you know, people want to people want to buy buy stuff. You know, people want to buy. Uh, I don't I don't want to say any specific things because sure. I of course <laughs> I don't want to. Yeah, I, I know a good number. Um, so I was just now looking at my notes from the presentation I gave last week, NFTs Beyond Digital Arts. So um, in the first, I think, I don't have the number what it was last year, but I believe like the fourth quarter of 2020 was maybe like a couple hundred million dollars in NFT volume. In the first quarter of 2021, there was two billion uh, in NFT volume. Mm -hmm. And so just based on what I get from the social zeitgeist, NFTs have really really just hit this this peak with this mainstream like i follow a lot of um non-tech people you know like immediately who comes to mind somebody who's just been repping nfts like crazy on twitter is mike tyson right iron mike tyson like one of the greatest icons in all of human history simply because he's got so many iconic shots and there's already so many memes of him applying them in, into the nft realm is just one small example um, another person who i follow on twitter who's based in the bay area which is where I'm at, is MC Hammer, another absolutely huge iconic figure is just really, really repping NFTs hard on his Twitter feed. And there's just so, so many more. And so some of the examples I have of non-digital art NFT are so, for example, real estate. Some of these things are already live on Avalanche and some of them are biz dev deals. So I'm not going to attach any brands to either any of these either because I don't know exactly. I don't want to step on anybody's toes. But for example, fractional ownership of property. So yeah, um, yeah so not only in the real world though, but also in the digital world, right? Because there's this convergence of the real and the digital. And so already you have like timeshares, but being able to somehow represent that fractional ownership on the blockchain as a tokenomics thing with NFTs is huge, but also in these virtual world, virtual worlds, which I believe Cubarium, you pronounce it better than me. That might have even been a play on that idea, right? Or am I wrong about that? Yeah, no, it is. It is like a game. Like I mean, I think that's where some of the most interesting stuff is. Is like Axie, where the like the NFTs, like you, it's you bring your own players to the game. It's like somebody's mm -hmm. got. You know, the chessboard is there for you, but you bring your own pieces. Sure. Yeah. Or, you know, or, yeah. Or Monopoly or whatever. You can be, you know, you can bring the, be the thimble or whatever. You can just bring whatever piece you want mm -hmm. and you can use those same pieces across different games. Mm -hmm. uh, so crypto seals, I thought was really interesting. And, you know, I, for a long time, I, I also have been of, of a mind that, you know, NFTs are just JPEGs and like, yeah, it's cool to own them, but is it mm -hmm. worth thousands of dollars sure you know, to me personally maybe not but then when i actually you know messed around with crypto seals i it was something that really showed me a lot of the potential that that was there there's definitely the dopamine rush of like opening packs or whatever and not Absolutely. opening seals not knowing what's in there and then just wanting to buy one more to see if you finally get the rare like that's mm -hmm. definitely real mm -hmm. but also just thinking about like man i wish i could play a dungeons and dragons game with this guy as my character sure 
and the resale value of those characters are going to be huge, right? So if you were to go into an online Dungeons and Dragons competition and you're some great Dungeons and Dragons player and you conquer like the ultimate level, the ability to resell that thing later for charity, let's say, and then somebody else buys that and then that's their character and all their subsequent games is going to be absolutely massively huge. I'm sure of it. Yeah, anything in like video games that's like, microtransactions like any of these like loot box things that, mm -hmm. like these like kind of like pack based things yeah you know you can totally translate translate that to the nft space and then you could maybe bring it between games like bring something that you earn in the first game bring it to the sequel sure. and that's have a good it idea. tradable have have marketplaces and that's one thing where i feel like a lot of times yeah, i play a lot of video games i'm very familiar with the space and one of the most common complaints about video games and is microtransactions yep. and these loot boxes and these things that are addicting they're shitty they're just trying to get you to spend extra money sure but i think that a lot of people would be more okay with them if there was a way for them to make money off of them if they got something good which you don't want to totally encourage like too much gambling and stuff but like or just have the ability to earn these things over time in the game Sure. Yeah, it's a balance, right? You've always got to have the balance in there. You don't want to encourage it too much, but the gamification is just unavoidable. And it's um, it's just, it's such a driver to the adoption or, of these. Or, yeah, or if you could just go to a marketplace, a secondary marketplace, and just like, all I want is this one particular item. Right. I'm happy buying it on resale sure. and paying the fair market price. Mm -hmm. And for people who want to kind of roll the dice, they can they can go and you know, buy, buy the actual packs. So I think there's like ways to actually improve that ecosystem to make it more fair, mm -hmm. make it more open and give people the options to participate however they want. And I think there's definitely the unexplored venue of like historical ownership. Sure. Which I haven't really seen anybody do this of like, this was- It's like provenance, winning. right? The actual provenance of something. Yeah, yeah. This particular NFT, like, you know, if let's say you, you made a looter shooter or something like that, where every weapon in the game was an NFT, mm -hmm. this was the, the gun that got the winning headshot in this esports game. Right. Oh yeah. That'll be huge. Yeah. No, nobody's, I've really seen take it, taken advantage of that, but you could mm -hmm. definitely do something, especially with the esports crossover of like, these were items used by this particular person mm -hmm. in this match or, or whatever. Yeah. I mentioned this to Connor before we start recording so Mike can fact check me on this, but I'm nearly positive that in 2020 esports um, crossed traditional sports. And I'm sure, you know, the nation being shut down for COVID was a big part of that. But in 2020, the revenue from esports crossed the threshold of the revenue for traditional sports. And I believe they're probably neck and neck this year. Maybe traditional sports is gaining a little bit more ground because the world's opening back up. But in the long run, I think the trend line is clear. Esports are going to be a competitor, if not greater than the amount of revenue that's already gen generated in traditional sports. And that's simply because there's the, the game, it's so much more wide open with, with esports. What is esports? Esports is really everything. And traditional sports is very limited to being in the real world with somebody and being competitive and being able to get access to those people during those times. So esports is going to be absolutely huge. And I, I, the, the analogy you gave there is the one I've been giving to everybody. And I might not have said it as articulate with the the D and D thing, but yes, exactly. Imagine the, the gun that got the kill shot in some huge competition then being resold for charity or being resold on a second market and being able to buy that and you actually have that gun so next time you're in the game playing you can say like look i have the prominence of this actual in-game item it goes back to that very person who did that kill shot on that huge game that's pretty compelling and then also the other accelerator will be like he said if every single thing you're picking up in a game every token you grab when you're playing mario every single um, you know, mushroom you pick up when you're walking across Hyrule, if all of these things have their own value, even if they're just fractions and fractions of a penny, it's not even a dollar value that matters. It's more just being able to then later represent them on some distributed exchange and being able to go there to that kind of marketplace and the distributed exchange could even be baked into the game, right? Like, so as you travel across Hyrule and you run across these different stores, those themselves could be distributed exchanges. Um, I just, I don't see any other world where this just isn't absolutely huge. It just seems like it has all of the components to be so, so, so big. And um, I think we're right on the brink of it being mainstream. I think the big barriers to adoption are, I haven't seen a lot of DEXs that, I haven't seen a ton of mainstream games that are doing in-app stuff. So again, talking to my son who's more dialed into myself, 
he told me that he read the new version of Grand Theft Auto has some type of blockchain functionality, but I think maybe you, Connor, or somebody else told that's, me that's that's not even a real blockchain. It's like some- No, 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 <laughs> that's in-game. Like, yeah, that's like part of the story in-game, I believe. It's not actually NFTs. It's right. just that there's their own, like, the, the game itself has cryptocurrency as part of the, like, story of, like, as it has, there's, like, there's- it's a diegetic. <laughs> right, which, which all, if nothing else, it just shows the direction they're headed, right? Like if nothing else, if uh, either they'll end up backing up by real assets through some like later subsequent mm-hmm. fusing of the technology, or they'll be driven to by the fact that everybody says, this is a hollow experience. Why are you guys telling me I'm getting these tokens and I can't later resell them? Because the entire market is going to become so much more savvy and so much more mature to all of these different um, offerings of the blockchain technology stack over the next five or 10 years that people are just going to come to expect these things. So I think that even the very fact that they're dropping, name dropping blockchain, even if it's not real blockchain, but to get back to my thought, I think the big barrier to entries are number one, I just haven't seen a bunch of huge games yet doing this. I suspect there's a lot of stuff happening in the labs. I know of a couple of different APIs that are on Avalanche. I'm not sure if these teams are public or not. So again, I'm just going to hold off on name dropping for now, but there's definitely a couple uh, different APIs that I myself am familiar with of being able to do in-game assets with C-chain NFTs and tokens. And then the other one is the exchange integration. And I suspect that'll probably happen quicker on things like DEXs than it will on you know traditional Coinbase type exchanges simply due to regulation and stuff, but it feels like those are the two barriers to entry. We just need one big major franchise to come in and show the world this is where it's headed and surely that's happening behind the scenes right now. And then the other one is simply exchange exchange integration. And due to the permissionless nature of DEXs, I suspect that really the ball is the ball is in the court of the first thing. Once there's a major player that has done this, I suspect integration uh, with exchanges will be relatively fast after that. Yeah, there is open sea, but there's some other stuff. But uh, yeah, I'm sure there'll be more marketplaces coming soon. But what, one thing I think that's also cool, an idea I just had is if you were to do these like kind of game NFTs, it would create kind of a permissionless system where you can move these things between games. They don't have to necessarily be between games of the same franchise. Mm. This might actually scare away some people. But, you know, if I have your, you know, if I have my, my guns in Call of Duty or whatever from, from Warzone, I get all those collectibles, mm-hmm. then I could, like me, indie developer, could just make my game where you could bring all your Call of Duty stuff over <laughs> Wow. and use them in my game, potentially without the publisher's permission. I don't know. <laughs> that might be a barrier to adoption. For, for some people, or maybe you would just like handle that with licensing and like. Yeah. So uh, see, I, I, I think you've touched on the answer right there. So that actually reminds me of an unfinished thought I had before. So to tie in what you're just saying with the thing about the access thing, axes, if I'm pronouncing it incorrectly. So you had mentioned today, the barrier to entry is like a thousand US dollars. You've got to buy three of these things. They all cost a few hundred bucks a pop. I'm not sure if the barrier to entry there is that fees are expensive on the network or if it's simply the IP of, Hey, that's- no, that's for the item. Got it. So I'm wondering. It's not, again, it's not set by. It's not set by the publisher. It's set by the market. Of like, I can just sell my things. I can add a set of price to it, and just the cheapest prices right now are like two, three hundred. They go way all the way up. Got it. So then I wonder, um, is there not just going to be competition that pour, forces that price down, and then only the premier brands are be able to charge that much, right? Because it seems like there's always going to be somebody who comes in and offers something similar just for way more inexpensive. It may not be as good value, like you always pay for what you get, but it seems like eventually the price is going to go down to the means of production other than when people pay for premier branding, right? Yeah, well, it is. a The axes are capped, I think. So I, so it's not a totally... Uh, yeah, there's definitely way more for sale than mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know what their metrics are, but there's a lot for sale right now. Got it. Prices go all the way up to like 999 ETH or whatever. Like wow. Price. And so, um, yeah. And then to sure touch- they're selling for that. <laughs> sure. And then to touch on your other thought. So, yeah, that might be a turnoff to some people. Perhaps Call of Duty guys would not want, you know, myself as an independent developer to be able to import their assets 
And so maybe there could be some licensing stuff, but then again, maybe there will just be an entire tribe of open source developers who all lean into that and they all accept that that's, you know, a possibility and they enable it in their apps. And then we just have this crazy mashup world where people are importing, you know, like dungeon type weapons into first person shooter things. And then, you know, like side scroller power up things into dungeon games. And like, we just have this complete mashup of different type of gaming dynamics all within, you know, clearly defined um, rules of what's available to be imported and exported. But I think that's a pretty good idea. I've never even considered that one, being able to import assets from one game into another. That's pretty big. Totally permissionless too. Right. Yeah. So, okay. A few other ones. I'm just going to run down my list of non-digital art assets, uh, NFTs. And if you want to weigh in on any of them, feel free to. So obviously I just went over fractional ownership of property with real estate. There's also proof of ownership. So I know Husky.space, for example, is um, issuing like, uh, I believe they're literally doing like clothing. And then they're also giving you like the proof of ownership in the form of a, an NFT. So basically that would be like a receipt, but something that's on the blockchain. Also something I think that's going to be incredibly obvious in the future. We all get receipts for everything so that we can have it, uh, uh, you know, a record keeping mechanism. And then obviously tokenizing that or making it on chain seems pretty obvious for a lot of use cases. There's also legal, again, cut me in if you have any thoughts here. There's legal, so um, things like identity. Identity is going to be huge. I've talked about this in the past today. It's very easy to do a social civil attack because you can spin up a trillion Twitter accounts um, for basically the cost of an email address. You can use an AI to generate human looking images that have never been seen anywhere on the web. You can't reverse engineer, you can't reverse Google search them because they're generated from thousands of pictures of people. You can create AI chatbots and then have these accounts drive the dialogue um, and the social sentiment back and forth simply by social sibyl attacking people. And one of the things I learned about in my Bitcoin journey is what's called the web of trust which is basically like you, this cryptographic sort of scheme where you can go along, everybody basically puts a public key into this, you know, general database. And I can go online and I can say, I trust Connor this certain amount and you give him a number. If I remember correctly, it's a negative 10 to a positive 10, but whatever. Negative 10 being, I really, really, really do not trust him. And positive 10 being like, I really trust him. And so basically you go and you give these ratings to everybody in this web of trust. And then later you can go and say, okay, um, I'm in Tokyo and I have $100,000 in cash. I need to swap it over for Avox. Who do I know in this city? I don't know anybody, but but Connor told me he knows somebody here who's like an over-the-counter trader. Um, do I trust that person? Well, let's check out the web of trust. I trust Connor a lot per my rating. He says he trusts them a lot. So therefore, I'm going to say I trust them a lot. It's not a foolproof um scheme, but it's pretty good. And that's the way a lot of these over-the-counter traders who do big volumes, that's the way this all works. It's in the web of trust. And so for years, I've thought, why does that not that same model not apply to our social accounts? Like it should be expensive for me to throw away my CG Cardona Twitter account simply because there's so much social equity in the web of trust that it would suck for me to have to rebuild that later. And that would be a civil uh, attack prevention mechanism. Go ahead. There, there's going to be so much with reputation. Mm -hmm. on-chain reputation because we have a record of what you've done so you could actually go through and construct like you know what is this address done well this they've clearly traded on pangolin they've mm -hmm. taken out loans they've like bought nfts like mm -hmm. they like this is clearly you know like a heavily used address versus like this is a virgin address hasn't done anything right um and you know what does that what does that mean and i think there's going to be a lot of value to having these addresses with some kind of reputation score attached to them. Not necessarily trust. I think there's going to be a lot of like pseudonymity, mm -hmm. but having, having the ability to kind of like have a real history of, of what you've done in your record. I think it's going to be really fascinating to see how that's used. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we have this in the real world. It's called like a credit score. Sure. Um, but, you know, it just how you know, hopefully it'll be used differently, you know, less discrimination, more, <laughs> sure, more empowerment, but and, uh, uh, and uh, there's some interesting projects. Like for instance, I'll shout out one called rabbit hole, okay. which is an e mostly an Ethereum based project, which is trying to get people to actually use different protocols and build their own reputation. Hmm. So they basically, they'll give incentives to, they just wrapped up one with like the graph where if you built a subgraph or became a curator in like the graph, you can like earn EXP, which was actually rewarded with like real tokens. And they bought different ones for like compound and like a bunch of other things to just actually try stuff out and like build build your own reputation. 
Yeah, so I agree. Huge, huge innovation ahead for identity and reputation. That's a, a really ripe area for innovation. And uh, if anybody has like thoughts around that, that's a good place to dedicate energy over the next couple of years, in my opinion, because there's so much impact to be had there that there's just a lot of opportunity. Um, another couple of legal ones, I know we, uh, Notary Public accredited, Accreditation, I'm, I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, uh, Patents and IP. Another big one that I've been waiting for for a long time, and there was actually somebody who previously that I worked with who knew a lot about this, and I've been waiting for them to launch a startup in this space, and they just haven't done it yet. I'm not going to call them out by name, but is just basically supply chain, right? So NFTs are really good for supply chain because you can do certificate of uh, product origin. You can authenticate goods. You can do provenance. You can do ensuring quality. You can literally track individual items. So a QR code on a can can be scanned anywhere, and that can be obviously replicated as an NFT. So something that I just, for years, before I even joined uh, Ava Labs, I've known like there is a ton of innovation around supply chain and the ability for NFTs and the Internet of Things to uh, impact supply chain. So that's something I suspect is in the works. What, what these things are all waiting on is like identity too. Like identity yep. will really, mm -hmm. really revolutionize how this works. I, I have a lot of thoughts on supply chain. I actually created a supply chain protocol a while, a few years ago. Oh, really? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 trick, the trick about the supply chain is the handoffs and how you pass something off from one person to the next. Mm -hmm. And you really have to make sure that you're making sure that the object being handed off is the object in question. So there is this like physical digital boundary that you have to be able to resolve and think about like how much effort you're willing to put into it. Like if it's, you know, uh, a, a thing of like sticky notes, like you don't care very much, but if it's your like classified information or whatever, your, your super high value target, you, mm -hmm. know, you really have to think about putting tamper, like where you actually are worried about like a supply chain attack, not just somebody losing track of something, but somebody like stealing it, tampering with it and trying to pass it off. And if you want to be able to use the blockchain to solve that problem, you really have to pair it with like tamper proof seal technology mm -hmm. or, you know, your tamper proof seal could be like on an Oreo pet package where mm -hmm. like if you tear it off it like <laughs> tears mm -hmm. tears the label versus like you know the government's best cia tamper proofing stuff mm -hmm. which i'm sure they have but i have no personal knowledge of mm -hmm. yeah right exactly and so what's the what's so is, is scanning stuff so you're saying sort of like scanning stuff is not enough it's also literally like we have to be able to, so how do people deal with that today like if i'm delivering a crate of pepsis across <laughs> i mean it's it's all like signature based but like i mean i can slap a qr code on something mm -hmm. but if i like it's not that hard for somebody to just take a picture of that qr code print out an identical one mm -hmm. put a fake box put the new QR code on the fake box and then hand off that fake box. If you're worried about that attack vector, you really have to be careful. Sure. Uh, but no, a lot of people don't worry about that. And that's why we have a lot of problems. And if you talk to some like senior, like military officials and stuff like that, they will say like the problems that like actually keep them up at night are mm -hmm. supply chain problems. Sure. It's like one of the biggest, uh, biggest things that I think has not been super exploited publicly Sure. but it is like a huge concern for people who care about the provenance of their computers sure. is that, you know, especially with a lot of like cross-border purchases and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, you don't always know what you get is legitimate. Like, especially like on Amazon, there's tons of like counterfeit retailers and, and stuff like that. So a good example might be when you get a Trezor, for example, it has that tamper proof hologram sticker or, or like on multiple places and each, each fold is like super glued. And so you get a sense of whether or not this package has been messed with. You still don't know whether or not that's for sure the real package you got from Czechoslovakia or wherever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in theory, it shows in multiple places it's not been tampered with. It's a huge thing, yeah. Because if I, if I use a Trezor or a Ledger that's been hacked and I mm -hmm. plug it into my computer to... Uh go get my crypto and then it just uploads its keys to mm -hmm. to the to the attacker and then they just steal all my money right. and i i think i've taken best practices i think ledger they actually have some like software i believe so which, yeah bootstrap thing i don't know how exactly that works if they're using like secure enclaves this is actually a use case for some of the secure hardware stuff i talked about like the intel xgx earlier or right. uh, tpms or whatnot Gotcha. So come, come in full circle to, to wrap up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A couple more last ones. So I know we talked about gaming, regulatory compliance. There's also DAOs. So similar to um, 
having like property ownership, you could also do voting rights in the DAO. Um, there's media, so decrypting and encrypting files. I know there's multiple different, um, go ahead. Okay, yeah. So one of the, the biggest unsolved problem in NFTs right now, in my opinion, is the ability for to make the content of an NFT only accessible to the owner. Right. So I've had people ask me about this. I don't have a good solution. I've thought about it a little bit. Mm -hmm. So basically the question is like the example, like let's say I have a song and I mm -hmm. it's a secret song and I only want the owner of the NFT to be able to listen to this song. Mm -hmm. How do you solve that problem? And like the tricky piece is like, well, you could like encrypt the, the piece with you know, the, 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 the item with the owner's key or something like that. So only they could decrypt it. But then how do you like when they transfer that, how do you do that for the next person? Mm -hmm. Or is it just everyone who's like ever owned it will have the ability to access it in the future? You just encrypt a new copy. Mm. Like you need like a custodian who will do like the encryptions for you or, or something like that. Or there's a better solution that I just haven't thought of. But that's a really hard problem. If you could solve that, there's a lot of people who are interested in it. Wow. Is, yeah, just making sure that only the NFT owners can, the NFT's owner can access the contents. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good problem to solve. Okay, yeah, and then lastly, uh, medicine. So for example, I know there's, or not just medicine, but uh, I have two of these in the group on medicine. So the one that I have is certifying negative COVID-19 test results to reduce the black market of fake tests. And this has been being done currently in Riviera, Maya, Mexico. And then another one I know about is there is a, um, I don't remember where I sat in Mexico, I apologize, but there's a city in Mexico basically where they deal with a lot of corruption. And so you might imagine if you get pulled into the legal system, there's gonna be some type of evidence and there's going to be, every time you go to court, for example, they might have to present this evidence and there's a trail of evidence and ownership. And so um, the idea is that they're going to create NFT type representations of all of the different evidence points mm -hmm. so that as you go through this legal process, you can be sure there's basically been no tampering with evidence or that everything is still in the state that it originally was. And so those are um, just a list of immediate ones that come to mind with regards to uh, NFTs. Yeah, and, I, and I'll say that like these are not things, most of what your list was are not things that NFTs give you by default. Sure. These are things that you can build because like we've barely scratched the surface of like what you can use them for. Because mm -hmm. like really anything in the world is an NFT, like literally like your phone, right. your book, even though, you know, they're, they're like kind of fungible, but mm -hmm. when once you like, write some notes in your book or get an autograph. Now, now it's non-fungible. Sure. Um, and so it's just a method for encoding anything. And it's just, it's a building block. Yeah. The analogy I was giving recently, again, with my whole convergence of digital and physical is, you know, cryptocurrencies are like for money, anything financial and NFTs are for everything else. So the, ex the example I've been giving is imagine you look around your bedroom or your office and you were going to tokenize everything in that room and move it into some virtual world, right? So literally you're going to create some type of AR or VR experience where every single thing in your room is represented as a token. I understand this is a bit of a stretch of an analogy, but just go there with me. Um, even if you have a fat stack of cash somewhere in your room, the amount of things in your room, which are NFTs are non sort of financial in nature are pretty much every everything other than whatever change in cash you have lying around. So really cryptocurrencies are for, you know, the new money of the world, but NFTs are really for everything else. And so, yeah, as you said, NFTs can be every, these things are sort of fungible, but then again, they're not. Once you have them and you sort of take ownership of them and they become yours, they're not really fungible, especially if you've done something to mark them in some way. And so I think we're just at the beginning of how revolutionary NFTs are going to be. And um, I know it's been really I've learned more about NFTs since I've been at uh, Auto Labs. So I guess uh, one final way to wrap this up is, so right now I know there's ERC-20 for uh, sort of like token sales, there's ERC-721 for NFTs, there's 1155, which I believe are like multi-token, um, multi-tokens, I guess. Are there other standards for NFTs other than ERC-721? What does sort of like the landscape look like going forward with regards to the actual technology? Uh... So the 1155 basically is just, it's a hybrid token that allows you to do NFTs and fungible like ERC-20 style tokens in the same contract. Okay. All, all the standard really says for like a 721 is just that an NFT must have these functions. And those functions are like transfer, get owner, and like get metadata. Mm -hmm. And that's like, 
that's really it. It's okay. not a lot to it. It's very basic. The place where there's room for innovation in, is how the metadata is stored. Uh, because basically, all the only requirement to be an NFT is you need to have like a link to to your meta to to your metadata. But there's like a soft standard for what that metadata file should be, but it's very weak. There's not um, a lot of room to do interesting stuff. Basically, the actual spec just says you should have a name, description, and an image link. What if your NFT is not an image? Mm -hmm. So there's not a robust set of standards for how to represent NFTs. So for example, uh, in our TOPS work with Bazooka Joe, NFTs have a front and a back, and some of the fronts are actually videos. Mm -hmm. So what we did was we added on to that standard. We always supplied an image so that it would be backwards compatible with anything, with any app that only implemented the standard. Mm -hmm. But we also provided additional functionality of like listing a front, a back, and, and stuff like that, copyright information, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I think there needs to be more work around standardizing ways to do more broad applications of the metadata and also just better understanding about how to properly store the actual content, making sure you're using a decentralized file system like IPFS versus just storing it in S3. That's a different problem. I don't want to go into it because we're running kind of long. <laughs> sure. But just, uh, I think that's where the real innovation is going to be is just making them totally interoperable from a content perspective, as well as just a metadata tracking perspective, more so than the actual on-chain operations, because those are like fairly basic. And gotcha. right now mm -hmm. I don't envision a ton of like we don't need more methods for like multi-signature. The one exception would be if there's a universal implementation of how to do royalties. Right. Because that's something that a lot of people ask for, mm -hmm. but is not actually very easy to implement in a standardized way. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Yeah, man. Wow. Tons there to unpack. Um, so yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you, Connor, as always. We will... Um, as I mentioned, Connor's going to be joining us on the regular, hopefully as much time as he's willing to contribute. So we'll be talking to him again soon. Thank you for your time, man. Always a, a wealth of knowledge. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Gabriel, where can people find you on Twitter? Ah, thank you. Yes. So CG Cardona, C-A-R-D-O-N-A is my Twitter handle. And um, as I mentioned, I'm going to, once we get this on YouTube, I will have chapters in the timeline. Um, and then I will also have all of the links, which I mentioned here. And then I'll put also Connor's Twitter handle as well as myself. Please follow us on Twitter. Um, he is a wealth of information. And I'm always also just endlessly plugging exciting stuff that's happening. And so please reach out to us. Always interested to connect with um, people in the ecosystem. And we're also, we're also working on getting an audio only version for people who prefer not to watch on YouTube. So that should be mm -hmm. taken care of hopefully, hopefully pretty soon. Yep, absolutely. And then even also considering some decentralized platforms other than YouTube and or Spotify or whatever that way, in case there's any censorship resistance uh, that we want to have in the future, anything like that, just trying to be aware of future options. So, all right. Thank you guys so much for your time. Thank you, Connor. We will talk to you guys soon. Cheers. Bye.